Um, I am thrilled to have when when I started putting together, you know, the when Hope and I started this little venture. Um, one of the things that I, I re, it really was important to be to not just limit our conversations to women winemakers or women winery owners, but the all of the women have done different things in the wine business to re, really promote and to create interest and to educate and to talk about and to make wine more approachable. And, and you know, and there's a lot of people behind the scenes that just never get their their just you know, they're just their due, you know, what am I trying to say? They're just desserts. Uh, and just desserts, that's not right either, but. Um, not quite. Jim, what are you really anyway, trying to but, say? There's a lot of us uh, women in wine out there who don't just make wine. We also contribute to the wine industry through all sorts of things like marketing and consulting and selling and all those other amazing things that helps get the wine from the vineyard to the bottle to the consumer. Mm. Is that what you're trying to say? That's exactly what she said. That's what that's what she said. So, and, and so, and one of the things when I had, you know, when, when I was putting this list together, it's like you're a woman near and dear to my heart because you like selling wine from wineries to consumers, and it, it's like, and it's I'm I really look forward to hearing more about how that that whole process works in, in Australia. And but first, you get to take us through a little bit of a journey uh, of of your wine journey um, from a a wine lover to where you're at today. So, and then we'll get into your hockey <laughs> career later on. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Uh, well, thanks, Jim. Um, it's not often I actually talk about uh, my journey in wine. It's uh, I often talk about everybody else's journey in wine. Uh, I guess I started in the wine industry in 1993. Uh, I was looking for something a little bit different to do uh, after my career in selling canoes and kayaks. And believe me, if you can sell canoes and kayaks, you can, and not be a, a proper paddler, you can pretty much sell anything. So selling has always been something that I've absolutely loved. Uh, the first winery I joined was De Bortley Wines, uh, which are based in the Yarra Valley and in Griffith in the Riverina in New South Wales. I joined their Melbourne office uh, in 1993. And I probably didn't have a huge interest in wine per se then. The most I knew about wine was what my parents drank and dad was really a whiskey drinker and he preferred the sweet whites so I grew up with uh, things like I'm not sure you'd be aware of these brands but in Australia Benin and Blue Nun and basically all these little sweet wines uh, although they did make a, a little uh, effort uh, when they went overseas in 1974 and brought back some ice wine from uh, Germany and I do recall uh, trying that wine so uh, when I started with De Bordley, the first thing they, they did for us was uh, put us through a wine appreciation course. And it was at the conclusion of that course when we're all sitting around a board table and the lecturer said to us, I'm going to op open a bottle of vintage port now. And there, I think there was about 20 of us at the table. And he said, I'm going to pour it at the start here and then you're going to pass it around. Please be very quick because by the time it gets around the table, it'll be gone. And I didn't have a clue what he meant by this. And it was the first time that I was uh, introduced to the concept that wine was a living, breathing thing. And this particular wine was called, uh, it was a 1965 Wyatt Earp, which uh, is a, a name you'd be familiar with in the States, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, it was an incredible wine. And it was at that moment that I thought, hmm, I really love this, uh, this idea of wine as a living, breathing entity with, uh, with, a, with a life and a journey all of its own. So uh, that began my journey. Uh, I, was, uh, I didn't stay at De Bordley all that long. I was more in the office side of things there. And an opportunity came up to uh, uh, manage what was then called the Australian Wine Club. And it was actually started by a guy called uh, Bill Jane who was the brother of Bob Jane, who's quite famous in Australia for uh, motor racing and, uh, and tyre chains and things like that. And he started this business back in the 80s for his daughters. And at the time, we were the biggest private wine club in Australia with over 10,000 members. And this was my opportunity to get out to the regions and actually meet the winemakers firsthand and, and walk around vineyards and see how the wine was made and see the passion behind the winemakers. And some of those brands that uh, were quite small in the marketplace then, 
are huge big names today and you know it was such a privilege to be involved at the start of some of uh, their journeys as well and we were one of the first uh, uh, I guess clubs to uh, uh, create what are absolutely you know run of the mill these days uh, wine dinners everybody does a wine dinner with a winemaker these days but it wasn't really a big deal back then and uh, we wanted to get the get our members more involved with the winemakers so we teamed up with uh, the guys from Coonawarra first and then McLaren Vale after that. And we brought them all to Melbourne and we gave them a, an absolutely winning proposition. Uh, we'll put you in front of, at a table in front of uh, 10 members. You get to talk about your wine and sell your wine. We'll even give you a free meal and you can pick up the rest of the tab after that. And it was, uh, it was a fantastic concept that worked really well. And uh, we, we started working with um, a, wine, uh, a wine writer who's uh, quite well known these days, Jeremy Oliver. Uh, he was just virtually starting the industry back then too. So that was that was uh, introducing me to wine from all over Australia and traveling around sourcing wine. Uh, and eventually uh, after my first child was born, uh, we decided to uh, head to a wine region really and, and, and go back to country life because I was originally uh, from the country. Uh, so we left Melbourne and uh, an opportunity came up in the Barossa Valley. So, uh, I ran my own little little cellar door uh, and wine club. Uh, I lived actually up above the cellar doors, behind the winery and above the cellar door. So that was uh, that was a pretty pretty interesting uh, journey there for a while. Uh, we didn't actually own the property, and uh, unfortunately, the the owner eventually wanted the property back, and he wanted to use it for his purposes. So I uh, we had I'm, to. I'm going to change I'm gonna tack. jump. I'm going to jump in really quick, only because. Cellar door. I know what cellar door is in Australia, but our our Americanized uh, fans may not know that know what a cellar door is. So a cellar door is a tasting room. Simple as that. Yes. <laughs> and there's actually a lot of uh, wineries in Australia that do call their cellar doors tasting rooms or visitor centres. We have a few different names for it, but we uh, largely uh, we largely call them cellar doors. I think it is a, a fairly unique vernacular. Uh, I know in uh, when I do a bit of work for the South Africans, they have wine farms, which is a, a different concept again, although they do kind of refer to cellar doors and tasting rooms as well. Well, cool. Um, so you've been across the United States. So you, you and I met at numerous conferences that in a, they're primarily the direct to consumer side of the world, um, you know, where we, where we tended to, to work, um, you know, helping wineries, re, get to in wine in the hands of their uh, consumers and their club members. Um, what are the, some of the biggest differences that you've experienced between the Australian market and the US market? You've got a lot more consumers, that's for sure. You've also got we a lot do, more wineries. That we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your, your, <clears throat> your market is a lot bigger than ours. Uh, your direct to consumer uh, side of the business is a lot more advanced than we are in Australia. Having said that, we've uh, we've come a long way in the last uh, couple of years, thanks in part to uh, COVID, but also uh, because the Australian wineries are looking to diversify their um, their sales channels. And uh, Australia in the last 12 months has also been hit with uh, huge tariffs uh, imposed by China, which is our biggest export market. So the pivot to selling direct and online has been uh, quite phenomenal in the last 12 months. As far as the differences go, uh the the, the uh, experience at the cellar door i guess is something from a tourism perspective that australia is uh, is really ramping up and doing uh, very well there's lots of uh, different types of experiences uh, we have a very strong wine food offering uh one of the things i noticed when i came to napa was uh, that not so many of the wineries can have uh accommodation on site or restaurants on site and, and those sorts of things. That's huge in Australia. Wineries with restaurants, wineries with accommodations uh, and event spaces uh, is a really big deal. So people travel from the cities out to the nearest wine regions, you know, say an hour, hour and a half, uh, simply to go out for the day to have, uh, have wine and food in a, in a vineyard environment. So quite, quite a big deal. Are, are wine vacations uh, more than just a wine weekend or something like that, but do people come to McLaren Vale or Barassa or, um, you know, uh, 
specifically to spend a week or two traveling and visiting as many cellar doors as they can. Uh, they do, they do. Uh, of course, we have been quite reliant on international travelers doing that. Uh, in Australia, it's not unusual for uh, people from the capital cities to head out to say the Hunter Valley or in uh, Western Australia down south to Margaret River for a weekend or a long weekend, that's pretty normal. South Australia, where I am, uh, just uh, within you know easy driving distance of Adelaide are some very famous wine regions in the Barossa and the Claren Vale, Adelaide Hills and Clare Valley. And almost everybody in Adelaide uh, has, has a favorite region or a favorite winery. Everybody kind of knows somebody who knows somebody who's in wine. So it's, uh, it's quite, um, quite patriotic here and going out to a winery on a weekend is, is absolutely not unusual, especially going out for, uh, for lunch and, and a bit of a tasting and, and tour around. Mm -hmm. well, so, so Hope has a question for you. I do, I have a question. Um, I'm really curious about some of these wines that you told us about as we were talking before the show. So one that fascinates me is the ladies who shoot their lunch. Tell us that story. Ah, the ladies who shoot their lunch. Uh, that is a brand uh, of Fowles Wines, uh, which is owned by Matt and Lou Fowles. The, the region is the Strathbogie Ranges, about an hour and a half uh, out of Melbourne to the north. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, region. There's not a whole lot of wineries there. Uh, I remember Matt saying to me, or showing me the label back in 2008. Uh, he said, well, what do you think of this, uh, this, this, this label? And it's a, it's a lady with, a, with a, the dog, the hunting dog. She's got the rifle over her shoulder. She's carrying some dead pheasants. And uh, I just absolutely loved it. Having grown up on a farm and you know, my parents, my dad taught me to shoot snakes mainly because they were everywhere. Uh, it just totally appealed to me. And I thought, this is absolutely fantastic. And it's very true to the, the brand values of uh, Matt and his family. Uh, they live on uh, several hundred uh, hectares of farmland. Matt is a big believer in uh, farm to table and uh, game hunting, uh, sustainable and ethical uh, hunting. And uh, his brands uh, really walk the talk. So this one really talks to me. I, I love the brand. And his 2018 Shiraz uh, just won a, got in the top 100 in Wine Spectator. Uh, one of only three Australian labels in the world to have that uh, accolade, which is great. And Jim, yes, you can get ladies who shoot their lunch from, I think it's Young's in uh, San Francisco. So yes, they fantastic. have a big, uh, big, distri big wide distribution in the US, which is fantastic. Yeah, when I looked it up, I found lots of opportunities. Is there a bottle right behind you that you could show us? Yeah, sure. Let's see if I can reach without unplugging. It's just so fascinating because it's a, yeah, it, feels like it's a cultural, <laughs> it feels like it's that? a cultural, it feels like it's a cultural difference here. I think there's, you know, lots of sensitivity around. Oh, uh, where do we go? And, Can you see yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty fascinating. That's the ladies right. who shoot their lunch. Um, look, you know, unapologetically, uh, it's clearly not aimed at uh, vegans. Um, but uh, there's a great story. Uh, I was working in the Fowl Salador over um, January, actually. Uh, that's where Jim and I were talking the other day. The reason I could actually go and help activate their cellar door was uh, because I bought a motorhome, which you guys call an RV, in order to be able to go out to the wine regions, uh, stay on site or nearby and, uh, and work at the same time, which was fantastic. And you know, it's incredible to tell the ladies' story to, uh, to visitors. And everybody just loves the story. It's um, you know, it really doesn't offend people here, but hope I understand that there culturally are some differences uh, over over your neck of the woods. Yeah, but you know, it's really fun to see how different things play in different parts of the world, which is why we're thrilled to be interviewing you and talking with you tonight. There's another wine that you mentioned that I'm curious about called another oh, yes. one. <laughs> Tell well, us a bit of a story with that one. I'll, I'll see if I can grab that. So years ago, probably 10 years ago now, I was speaking at a conference in Queensland and I was telling a marketing story 
uh, about the ubiquity of uh, water. And there was a brand called Another Bloody Water that had come onto the marketplace. And, you know, there's so many brands of bottled water out there. And the parallel was that there's also so many brands of wines out there and how do people make choices? Uh, what are the different stories? And there was a very savvy old guy in the audience. His name's John and he owns a winery called Cedar Creek in the, in the Gold Coast hinterland region. And literally before I'd even finished speaking, he'd been on the phone to his lawyer and he had trademarked another bloody wine. And he put his money where his mouth is and he actually produced this wine, put a label on it. Um, it's a product of Queensland. And uh, he's also uh, into supporting medical research on the back. But uh, there you go. Probably another un-PC wine for the American market. Another bloody wine. <laughs> now, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I've been in the wine business a little over 20 years. And, um, it, it, and when the cute little animal names started coming out of Australia, um, you know, it, it was, you know, Yellowtail was like just starting to come out. And, and would say oh gosh all these cute little australian animal names and then it it, it just seems like there's a, a much uh, more fun sensibility about australians and they don't care what it ha doesn't have to be a formal family the jones family estate and winery it's like it's it's silly and it's fun and you know they just don't really give a they don't give two hoots about what their brands you know, say it's like it's them. It, it so many of these brands just represent them, and you know they they just they don't have to do market studies. They don't have to do, you know, years of research on a, the proper name. It's like nah, women who shoot a, who shoot their lunch. It's, Ladies it's who shoot their lunch. <laughs> that too. Doesn't it feel like um, it's a cultural um, opportunity to really bring out the essence of the country and the society? So, and tell tell just tell us what it's like to be in Australia in the wine business in particular, but also to be a woman in the wine business and just educate us, if you would. Yeah, look, the wine industry in Australia has changed considerably in the twenty five years or so since I've been involved. Uh, like like in the US and around the world, we are a male dominated industry. There's, there's no question about that. Having said that, uh, I think there's more female winemakers uh, undertaking courses now than there, there are males. So uh, I expect that the, the, the tide will shift. Um, there's a big movement here in Australia through the, the Women in Wine to uh, uh, promote uh, what women are doing and to create awards around all the different uh, roles that women play in the wine industry. Jane, who uh, heads that up, uh, you know, she's quite candid in saying we shouldn't have to have an awards uh, like this. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to recognise women in wine. We should just all be people in wine, really. And I guess uh, throughout my career, I've always felt like I'm simply a person in wine. I do understand that there, there have been moments of, uh, I guess, some, some levels of uh, discrimination. Um, I tend to ignore those. I actually quite like working with blokes. So it's, uh, I find that fun. I like the diversity of working with pretty much everybody in the wine industry. And uh, I don't see so much of the uh, discrimination. I mean, there's individuals as there are in any uh, sector and in any industry. Uh, but I think the I think that uh, women are, are well respected. Uh, we're, we're known to be great winemakers, have great palates, uh, and we're we're right throughout the uh, uh, wine wine industry supply chain. So yeah, ubiquitous. I would hope. <laughs> so one thing, I, and I'm really unfamiliar with the how the wine how wine sales are done in Australia. And granted, I know what do you have about 10 million people that live in Australia. Um, Bit more Roughly. than that, Jim. 20, 25 oh. million. <laughs> oh, God, I guess I should just. It's been a while since you've of, been here, I know. <laughs> I guess. So, yeah, so, but we have 33 million people that just live in California. So it's like, mm. it is kind of this weird, and, but you're spread in a country much larger than the US. But um, how is the wine, you know, from the wine business, the, does it have to go, is it sold through distributors that then sell to restaurants that then sell to consumers? How, how does that work? work in the in australia we're really lucky jim we don't have your three-tiered 
system that is uh, mandatory. We also uh, don't have the border restrictions around where we can sell wine in Australia. So a winemaker can choose to sell wine direct to pretty much anybody who wants to. He can sell directly to the retailer, directly uh, to the restaurant, directly to the consumer. Uh, they can also sell through the distributors uh, to retailers, etc. Really depends on the scale of the business. It depends on the uh, the uh, scope of the business. Uh, a lot of wineries in Australia, the the medium and large ones with uh, lots of inventory to sell, will of course use uh, national distribution in order to get their wine out there. The smaller winemakers uh, will often be out there themselves selling wine, or they might have a, a rep that's out there selling wine on their behalf. But really, we've got um, plenty of choices in the ways that we can sell wine here, yeah, which is that, great. That, that, is, that is so refreshing. It's like, it, you know, it, the, in, you know, in the U.S., it's just, it, there's so many different levels and tiers and, and complications. And even in, at, in my cellar door, I have, you know, we ship to all, to most states, uh, but it's a challenge and I have to know all of the laws for all the states and yeah, all it, of the- it boggles, it boggles oh, our it, mind. You know, I, I can't imagine being anywhere in Australia and saying, why can't I have that wine from that winery that I want? You know, I, yeah. I, I, I can, so it's, it's great. And of course, even during our lockdowns, uh, we didn't shut any of the um, uh, bottle shops here. Definitely not. They, yeah. they, they were an essential service and they kept operating. The <laughs> cellar doors did unfortunately uh, get shut down, but online sales were allowed to continue. So, so we were very fortunate there. Unlike our great friends in South Africa who have had something like 20 weeks uh, in the last 12 months where they've been unable to sell wine at all and they're faced with, a, with an incredibly difficult uh, challenge uh, as vintage is looming with uh, where to store wine when they still have so much in storage because it couldn't be sold. So we all have our different challenges. Uh, we didn't have- Yeah, no, they, uh, yeah, I, you know, and now you're in the middle of summer and harvest is uh, just a couple of months away and, and things like that. Um, I'm really curious to find it because like here in California, Australia has had its share of calamities outside of, of COVID. And it just seems like every last winter about this time, everything was about Australia burnt to the ground. And, <laughs> yes. and, and tell me how things have recovered from that. And, and... Yeah, look, uh, for, for a lot of uh, wineries and wine regions, it was quite tragic. Uh, there's, there's many, many stories of uh, winemakers who lost their, their vines, their properties, uh, or at the very least their vintage through smoke tanks. So that was pretty tough. And of course, uh, straight on top of that was, uh, was COVID. Uh, then on top of that was, uh, was the China issues. So yes, we've certainly been pummeled in a lot of different ways. And I think depending on who you speak to and depending on what the, um, what the uh, business case was for a lot of wineries. So for those who had their, um, I guess, their eggs in several baskets. They've managed to, to come out of things kind of okay, provided you've got wine to sell, which uh, in some places became an issue, just no wine left to sell. Uh, so those that were able to quickly activate online did okay. Um, those who were very heavily reliant on one uh, channel or another, maybe not so, not so great, especially if uh, on-premise was the major channel because the restaurants of course uh, got shut down for so long as well so yes there's certainly been some challenges uh, Australian the Australian wine industry is uh, incredibly tough and resilient uh, that's what I love about the people here I think that's uh, a trait worldwide in the wine industry and agriculture in general uh, we're one of those industries that uh, is vertically integrated so whatever happens at the uh, at the vineyard level is going to uh, make its way through to the rest of us uh, throughout the supply chain as well uh, but I think we're, we're looking up, we're always looking positive. And you mm -hmm. know, as you said before, Jim, Australia is a very big place. So whilst the fires and, and other issues may affect uh, some regions, it doesn't affect the entire country. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've definitely had that experience in, in Napa and in Northern California. It's, like, it's between, you know, floods and fires and uh, pandemics and uh, we're just waiting on frogs and locust snacks. That's. I think uh, you had them. Didn't you have some um, locust hornets? Wasn't it 
hornets? Oh, the, mur the murder the hornets. Uh, murder hornets. North <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, uh, we've arrested them all. Um, so good, we've good. Death so, penalty yeah, they're, for they're, sure. Yeah, they're doing time in 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 a bee penitentiary. So it's good. <laughs> they're do, doing hard labor. Um, nice. Yeah, no, it's it is it's it's it, it's nuts. Um, one of the things you know, one of the ways that the the in not just California wine industry, but wine industries around the country uh, have survived during lockdowns and shutdowns uh, is virtual world. And a year ago, none of us knew what Zoom was and we didn't know what the heck uh, this was. And now it's a thriving channel for us. Uh, what has Australia done? Is it, is it a concept that, that has been embraced down there? And, and if so, tell us some stories about it. Virtual yeah, one. sure. Um, yeah, it was quite quite funny when it all began. I'd, I'd been doing a lot of uh, online um, uh, learning, you know, online uh, teaching, I should say, uh, through Zoom for, for quite some time. So for me, it was not a big leap to go, oh, well, everything's uh, on Zoom these days. But it was a very different concept, of course, for a lot of the wineries. Uh, there's been some very successful initiatives here. One was uh, run by the National Wine Centre uh, here in Adelaide. Uh, they ran and a, an A to Z of wine uh, virtually, where they went using A, B, C for the different wine regions, uh, going around the country, uh, selecting wines, uh, getting the winemakers on Zoom, uh, sending out some little uh, test tube packs to, uh, to consumers, which, uh, which was really well received. And then everybody jumping online together and uh, going through the wines. That was, that was really well received. Uh, there's been a, a bunch of other smaller wineries and uh, distilleries even that have set up our weekly uh, tastings. Uh, the most successful of them are the ones where they're highly engaging. There's also uh, a fantastic event in Australia called Pinot Palooza, which you may have heard of. Uh, a fantastic uh, guy by the name of Dan Sims uh, runs that. And of course, normally they're going all around Australia and Japan and New Zealand with this uh, incredible event, which this year was taken online. And they actually sent out to us, um, oh, I haven't got one handy, but uh, the, the Pinot was sent out in little cans and it was fantastic. They had the music, they talked about the wine um, and you, know, you sat there and drank these uh, little Pinot cans which there was a dozen of them with 125 mil in each. And <laughs> that's, that's a big day, can I just say. That's, yeah, you're, <laughs> a you're, really you're, big day. <laughs> you're, you, you're, turning, you're giving your keys to somebody else. And... <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's the thing about Zoom. You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> it, 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 absolutely. Um, so tell us more about um, your just your plans for wine tourism Australia and and how do we bring tourists back and you know what is, what does that look like you know from your efforts and it's like I know you have a really you know a great staff and a great team that puts us together I really am enamored with the whole motorhome idea and having <laughs> going winery to winery in a motorhome I just I think that's the coolest thing ever talk about it talk about an organization that like I'm going to bring it to the people and and I just think it's brilliant. Right? Yeah, uh, so what, I guess one of the big things that we saw when uh, lockdown first occurred or when we first came out of lockdown, because of the social distancing rules, one of the things that uh, got quickly banned here was uh, standing up drinking alcohol in any place. That included at the cellar doors. So the traditional belly to the bar tasting, which has uh, been the standard in Australia for ever, uh, was quickly moved to seated tastings. Now, anyone that knows me knows that I've been banging on about seated tastings being the gold standard for many, many years. I believe that they're the very best way to deliver an experience and to engage with people and to generate sales. Uh, so we quickly moved to that. So I saw that as an absolute positive. And most of the wineries have now retained that, uh, that style of service, which is great. And of course, they had to begin charging for that uh, experience as well. When you can only have a certain amount of people in for a certain amount of time, they had to think through uh, creating an experience that maybe went for 45 minutes. What was that going to look like? How were they going to deliver it? And I don't think we're going to look back from that. I don't think we're going to see a return to 
standing, you know, 10 deep at the bar with a free tasting and everybody, you know, trying to get a, get a drink. It's really not the way to sell wine anyway. It doesn't give a great experience. It doesn't uh, promote the brand in the best light. Uh, so I think that's been a, a great positive that's come out of COVID. And it's also started to educate the consumer that wine has value. So I don't know why this free, or where this whole free tasting idea ever came from. You know, there's no other industry in the world that just gives away its product uh, uh, mm. for entertainment purposes, for, for people to wander around on a weekend and basically, um, you know, enjoy wine and not pay for it. So um, I think that's been a big turning point. And people are also uh, telling me that they're getting much better sales from that level of engagement too. It's a, it's a new concept. Uh, it's a hospitality approach as opposed to a bar approach. And that's a challenge for some of the wineries in training their staff, which is where my team comes in, where we'll go out and train them to, uh, to service appropriately. Um, so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a quite interesting transition this, year, this last year. So tell us a little bit more about um, the benefits of this transition and just as an industry and a culture, how you've harnessed it and how you think that might translate to other countries. Uh, well, so, some countries have been doing this quite well. I always look to uh, South Africa, which has been um, fantastic with its wine tourism and a lot of seated tastings. And look, to be fair, Napa and Sonoma have been uh, on the front foot of that for a long time as well, with seated tastings being quite the norm. Uh, what we've also now uh, integrating is the food side of things. So many wineries have a, have a restaurant on site. So there's the food component, but then there's the, the cellar door component. Now we're seeing a little bit more of uh, a crossover, a bit of a hybrid between the two, where there's a food and wine matching component. So the food's being brought into the, the tasting experience. And, you know, it's, it's really not a big leap. If you think about uh, going out for dinner, imagine being told you had to stand up uh, and eat your dinner for an hour and a half. Um, it's not a very comfortable experience. It's not very engaging. But that's something we've been asking people in uh, our tasting rooms and our cellar doors to do. Uh, forever so actually getting people to sit down means that uh, they can mm. relax they can enjoy the atmosphere and let's face it our wineries are all located in absolutely beautiful locations so they can get to really see and feel what the region is all about and hear the story and they're much more uh, open to hearing the story when they're seated and, and relaxed so uh, that's that's been the big uh, the big change and I think wineries are starting to see the benefits of that now too. Yeah, I remember the, when I first got into the business and my first winery and all of the wineries in our immediate area were all free tastings. Nobody was, and it, there was no seated tastings. There was no garden tastings. There was like, there was the, the belly up to the bar, free tastings and here's our tasting menu and you tell me, and it was just like, it was like a free bar. And, and the, the original discussions that we were having, because some winery started charging like $10. Oh my God, $10 for a, you know, a tasting. And, and then pretty soon it was just like, we started to see people that were actually serious about wine tasting and not just people that were looking to get a quick, you know, get, go see eight wineries and get, a, get hammered and let our designated driver drag us back to the hotel. And, you know, it, it, we started to see serious wine buyers and all of a sudden, not only were people willing to spend, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars for a tasting and then doing it in a much more relaxed, formal format. And all of a sudden they start buying more. They, you know, we think it was a success if they, if each person walked out with a bottle of wine or each couple. And then pretty soon it was like, man, you had a chance to pour four or five or six of your wines in a nice formal format and they're buying cases of wine and they're joining your wine club and it just and they're paying you to do all of this and it's you know so it is a transition that it was a weird leap of faith that made such perfect sense and so now it's in one of the things here in at least in California we're required now to do things by reservations only and this is the next big transition um, because COVID is like you have to, you're limited to outdoor tastings right currently in California. 
It's middle of winter, it's raining outside. Um, you know, so people just have these have umbrellas or whatever, but but we don't have the space anymore. And but I love now being reservation only because that will also help you with staffing. And it's that's kind of the next transition I see for consumers here is that you need to plan your day now a lot more than just jump in your car, hire a driver, go see six wineries. And it's like, no, three wineries is enough. That's a good day. It's like, go have lunch, go spend money elsewhere. Um, I mean, that's, I, I can assure you, that's what's gonna happen next in, in, in Australia. I mean, it's, it's and I love it. It's like, I really love, it's the education now of saying, sorry, we're no longer open to the public, we're by appointment only. And you're right there, Jim, and that, that was also another, um, I guess, outcome of uh, the COVID uh, restrictions. People did have to book ahead. So a lot of wineries had to very quickly get their tech in order in, so that people could book online. And, of course, the advantages of that, as you've just pointed out, become very clear. You can resource effectively when you know how many people are actually coming to visit you for the day. You can plan for it. So uh, there's, there's lots of upside for the wineries. Educating consumers that uh, bookings are required is, of course, uh, you know, ongoing, uh, but people seem to be getting pretty good at it. Uh, it's interesting looking at the demographics of those who are very uh, willing and unquestioning on the whole booking and charging for wine tastings versus those who you know, get, get quite a bit sniffy about the uh, idea that they have to actually pay for a tasting. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's the older folk who are used to going out to the wineries uh, on a whim and for a free tasting that are not happy when they arrive and realise, one, they have to have booked first because there's no room for them, and two, that they actually have to pay for the privilege of, uh, of tasting wine. So um, I, think, I think it still augurs well for us. Uh, we're all chasing the, the millennials and, and the Gen Zs now for uh, future business. And they're the ones that are looking for the experiences and they're willing to pay for the experiences and the stories and the education. So uh, I think the timing's right for us to be able to offer this kind of thing and, and really move the industry in a different direction. And that was actually my next question about the next generation. How do you see them consuming wine, although they're, they're sort of playing by the new rules uh, because it makes sense because that's all they know. But what do you think the future of the wine industry will be both in Australia and Jim to you in California? Yeah, look, um, uh, obviously we follow a lot of what happens uh, in the US. We're well aware of uh, the hard seltzer craze that's happening in the US. <laughs> Don't worry, it's here now too. Uh, yeah. A friend of mine uh, actually uh, posted a, a, a pic of being out at a, I think she was actually out at a, a winery event and she had a, a seltzer and I went oh my god you know it's uh it's getting everybody um I think we, what we have to understand is the way in which people choose to consume alcoholic beverages these days and it's very much uh based around occasion so people won't just drink one category throughout uh a week a month a year they will drink for the occasion so that might be, uh, you know, we'll have some, have some cocktails with the girls on a Friday night before we go out, or mm -hmm. uh, we'll have uh, a dinner party where we'll bring out the good wine. Uh, on the weekend, we'll, we'll head out to a winery uh, for lunch and a tasting and explore uh, wine country, that sort of thing. Uh, and again, it comes down to the experiences. So the younger people are very much looking for the story, the authentic uh, people, the brand story learning who's who behind the scene uh, and of course being able to go to places where they get the opportunity themselves to interact with each other that's really important uh, most people are heading out to the wine regions for social activities and this has been especially true post-covid um, a lot of the times when i was uh, speaking with clients uh, post-covid i would be saying to them look you need to be really aware that uh, people haven't caught up for you know weeks or months this is their first opportunity to see each other face to face at a table mm -hmm. in close contact so the way in which we offer the experience has to change as well to cater for that because at the end of the day we're in the wine business um we only get paid if we sell wine so that has to be the ultimate goal we still however need to understand what it is that's going to uh, 
uh, get people in and keep people in the wine category. And it's going to be around how we position ourselves with the experiences and being part of uh, a total lifestyle uh, choice. Have, have many wineries down there, I imagine the, it's a little bit more of the Wild West where you're able to do things, but uh, um, do they turn to other things that draw people to the, to the cellar doors, like music, like food festivals, like, um, you know, a wine master class, like, I mean, just, just different ways to get people then, whether they have a large venue or not. Um, how, are, how are wineries doing drawing people in on a larger scale? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Jim. Um, I refer to them as experiences. So we, we very much talk about tourism experiences as opposed to simply wine experiences. So if we think about the totality of people going out to a region, they're looking for a range of experiences across the day. Now, the more that a winery uh, venue can offer itself, the better chance it has of retaining or attracting people uh, and retaining them on site. And the longer you can keep people on site, the more you can extract from their back pocket, hopefully. So if I think of some major tourism-oriented uh, wineries in Australia, we've got uh, Sepults Field in the Barossa Valley, which combines uh, some fantastic heritage, but also uh, has co-opted and worked with other uh, businesses, like-minded businesses, to uh, create uh, a village atmosphere. So there's, you know, you can go out there for the day you can um, make, make a knife, which is great for people who want to make knives. Um, there's uh, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, milliners on site, there's shoemakers, there's uh, olive oil producer, there's all sorts of things on the one site, which makes it a destination. So I call, I call it creating a destination in your own right. It's uh, about getting people to come to your destination and to really spend some time on the property. Uh, another client of mine, Gem Tree Wines in uh, McLaren Vale. They're an organic biodynamic uh, producer. They've got nature walks. Uh, they've teamed up with a company called Cabin to put uh, little off the grid tiny houses uh, on the property. Uh, so it's all in the name of uh, creating uh, great experiences for people to really immerse themselves in wine country and around the brands and around the brand's uh, authenticity. Events are a huge thing as well, Jim. Of course, over the last 12 months, that's been a, a big problem. Uh, wine regions are well known for hosting really large uh, music events. So a lot of that you know, has gone by the wayside, but they're starting to pick up again, which is, which is great. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's the one thing in our world. It's like we dearly miss you know, any sort of large gathering. We used to be able to do weddings at our winery and, um, you know, just even, we can't have more than six people uh, oh, together wow. still. And so that really limits things. So even having to spread things out. So it's it's a very slow process in our, right, currently with us. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that that, that that improves and that I'm still planning, we're still planning on large larger music events and, uh, things later in the summer, hopefully in the fall, at least by harvest time. Um, so yeah, yeah. That's, it, yeah. It, it is. It's really tricky. And look, we don't. We could be in the same position um, any day. We don't know. Victoria's just got into a snap five day lockdown on Valentine's weekend. I just uh, saw so that. <laughs> it's just crazy. So uh, my my mates at um, Fowles had uh, obviously a wedding planned on the site for the Saturday. And the bride on the Friday said, is there any chance we can get married tonight? So, you know, they had to bring it forward to, in order to do that. But the cost to business is, of course, uh, huge. Uh, and the, the lengths to which a lot of the wineries have gone to potentially um, mitigate the, um, the close proximity uh, uh, rules, uh, they've invested in outdoor dining and outdoor types of areas in order to be able to carry on, really. Uh, so, yeah huge changes that have been required mm. and huge amounts of capital investment that have also gone into a lot of these uh, uh, ideas. So one of the things I w we wanted to dive into a little bit more is your hockey career. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm not sure if it's that much of a career. <laughs> uh, it's, well, I, I'll expand upon it. It's like you played for the women's national, uh, no, you didn't. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> not that but, good. <laughs> well, but, but, but tell, uh, that's a fun thing. Is it's, yeah, it tells well, a little bit actually, more about that. It's actually funny. I um I I remember going home from from school one day, and I I I'd seen Dad playing um, golf uh, on the weekend. I didn't know it was called golf, but uh, I went home and I said, "Hey, I've I've signed up to play uh, hockey." And he just looked at me. I said, "You know that game you play on the weekends?" He goes, "That's golf." I said, oh, well, anyway, I'm playing hockey. What I didn't know at the time was that my father had been uh, quite a good hockey player and coach uh, in, his, in his day. Uh, so, of course, here I was starting to play hockey at, you know, 10 years old or whatever. And, of course, you know, out he came with his coaching and things like that. And I was pretty competitive. And I did play on a junior state teams for a few years before I got injured and then found travelling and, you know, hippie vans and, um, and alcohol. Uh, and then uh, it wasn't until much later that uh, my son started playing hockey when he was probably 11 or 12. And he went down the path of uh, playing state hockey for South Australia in the junior, junior ranks, which was great. Then my daughter started playing hockey. So then I started, uh, I had been coaching on and off for years and I started coaching her team and other teams. And eventually, you know, there's that pull to strap on the boots and pick up the sticks so so I did and you know again nothing by halves and uh, next thing I'm trying out for the the, you know, the masters state teams and uh, getting in those until injury finally made me you know, stop Rob stop <laughs> stick stick to just just a little bit of right arm exercise and paddling of course because I, I love kayaking um, but yeah I uh, my son uh, with his state hockey uh, was fantastic. Uh, I managed some of those state teams, which I uh, don't know if you've ever done that sort of thing before, but uh, to manage 18 boys for two weeks uh, on the road, playing hockey, feeding them, making sure they stay in their rooms. <laughs> Quite challenging, but uh, that's a, that's, really that's good a fun. Lot of, that's a lot of smelly boys in one <laughs> I don't know. I think the girls are worse sometimes. <laughs> uh, I, I did the same so, with basketball and with baseball, so it's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean, then. I uh, know. So I know the highly drill. Highly rewarding, though. Highly rewarding, and you know, <laughs> wonderful to to be part of their development. Yeah, for sure. So we are just thrilled. So, what is the one last thing you'd like to leave our audience with, so that we know a little bit more about Australian wine and sales and your remarkable business, the Wine Tourism Australia? Well, yes, Wine Tourism Australia, it's a great name if you can, if you can get it, which I managed to do. Uh, of course, uh, we specialise in working with wineries to help them develop their, uh, their wine tourism experiences uh, and train their staff in how to, how to sell, really, because at the end of the day, selling to, to tourists, people who are on holidays, is a very different concept to standard selling. Uh, so that's what we do. We, uh, we help uh, wineries sell more wine to more people, more often for more profit. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the mantra. Um, look, I, I've, Australian wine tourism is fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of support and investment from uh, the state governments, federal governments, and, of course, from people themselves getting out to wine regions and really discovering what's going on. I mean, we've got 65 wine regions in Australia, so there's quite a lot to explore. Um, wow. I didn't know that, did you, Jim? I did not know that. <laughs> Most Australians, uh, even those in the wine industry, don't know that either. So 65 wine regions. Uh, dotted all over the country of, uh, with offering such a diverse range of wine styles, uh, different people, different uh, vistas. Uh, I mean, I never get bored going out to wine regions. They're absolutely stunningly beautiful here and overseas. Uh, so, yes, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's something I absolutely love to do, get out and about and uh, tell the stories and share the love of uh, our Australian wines and wine regions. What is the one crazy, why is there a winery there story that you have? Why is there a winery there story? Oh, gosh. Um, I know I'm, putting, I'm putting you on the spot. I, yeah, uh, yeah, only you because, are. Well, only because I was, I was just, because Australia is so huge. I'm still kind of wrapping my brain around the fact that there are 65 wine regions. I mean, there's even in California, there's not that many, um, or, but it, there are there are wineries in all 50 states. In Canada, there's wineries in all but two provinces. 
Uh, there's wineries throughout Mexico, so I guess kind of equivalent. But but every once in a while, you hear about a winery that there's nobody or within 500 miles of that winery or something like that. And I was thinking Australia probably has several of those wineries that they some someone just put up stakes in the middle of some bizarre place that makes really great wine. So that's the angle I was shooting for, but. Okay, uh, most of the wineries in Australia are within Kui of where people live. And of course we've got uh, the, 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 there's only one state which is actually a territory in Australia that doesn't produce wine and that's the Northern Territory. However, for a while there was a winery and I can't remember where it, where it was located, but it was, uh, if you know Australia, the Northern Territory is really not suited to growing um, Vitis vinifera, and they were they were the they had the dubious uh, honour of actually being able to produce two vintages a year because of the wow the climate. Yeah, because now, it's the, the quality of that there, wine. Right? Yeah, not so sure about that, and it doesn't exist anymore. But they did give it a go. Yeah, the, I mean, it's the tropics there, right? It's sub subtropics. Yes, well, where this winery was, uh, it was probably more desert than tropics. Uh, of course, when in north in northern Australia, there's actually only two seasons: the wet and the dry. So <laughs> very not conducive to uh, to making wine from grapes. Having said that, uh, in in far north Queensland, uh, there's lots of wine that is made from tropical fruits. So there's there's fruit wine that is made, and that's a whole different category. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've, I've been to Hawaii and had Hawaiian wine from the one winery that grows Vitis vinifera on top of Mauna Kea, and it's horrible. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> there is that, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have been able to speak with you tonight, Robin, or tomorrow for you. And we'd love to continue the conversation. And I really want to do an interview with those women who shoot their, it's the ladies who shoot. The ladies who shoot their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> got to interview them. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jim Morris. We really appreciate you coming to us from California. I'm in New Mexico, so I think there's a wet and a dry season here too. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. But we will continue this conversation uh, in two weeks on a Sunday, and we will bring that information to you uh, through our social media posts and we're excited to bring more of Robin Shaw and her delightful stories and company to you again soon. So I'm Hope Katz Gibbs with Incandescent. Thank you so much for watching us this evening on Facebook Live and you'll be able to see our recorded interview um, on Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV. So we'll talk to you soon. Happy Valentine's Day. And to you. Thanks, Thanks Hope. Thanks, Jim. Robin, have a lovely Monday and hope uh, hope everything hope the harvest goes fabulously this year. Thank you.